Chapter 25, October 14th, 1793. All is thick and melancholy gloom. Letter of Dr. Benjamin Rush, Philadelphia, 1793. Mother Smith sent a mule cart to the cooperage. I scrubbed the cart with boiling vinegar while Eliza gathered the drugs and herbs we would use to treat the children. Joseph prayed over his sons and Nell while we packed bed linens and blankets. When the cart was ready, we dragged the mattress down the narrow staircase and laid it in the cart. I carried Nell. Mama, she called weakly. I bit my lip and asked my heart to be hard. I couldn't help her if I fell apart. Joseph insisted on carrying each boy downstairs by himself whispering while he tried to massage the pain from his son's heads. He gently lay them on the mattress and tucked them in so they wouldn't be jostled. Take care of them, he said hoarsely to Eliza. Aren't you coming? I asked. Joseph shook his head. They have a better chance away from me or anyone with the fever, he said. He'll be fine, and those babies will be fine said Mother Smith, resolutely, as she patted Joseph's arms. The society will watch out for Joseph. Eliza, don't you worry about him. Go on now. Go with God. Joseph's knees buckled slightly as he kissed the boys goodbye, laid his hand on Nell's head, and hugged Eliza. Mother Smith curled her fingers around his elbow. His tall frame leaned against her withered one as Eliza slapped the mule's rump and the wheels of the cart squeaked. The city was darker than I had ever seen. The moon had already set, but no light flickered in the whale oil lamps that lined High Street. The lamplighters had all fled the city, or died. Candlelight spilled from only a few windows, and the stars were faint and distant, as far away as hope or the dawn. We struggled to get the mattress out of the cart at the coffee house. Our arms strained under the awkward weight, dragging it around to the back gate, through the yard, and finally in the back door. At last we set the mattress and the children on the dusty pine boards of the front room. We should keep them down here, I said. It's too close upstairs and frightfully hot in the day. I agree, Eliza said, but I don't like having the mattress on the floor. Let's push together those tables and set the mattress on top of them. Should we open the windows while it is dark? That's how the thieves got in. Eliza pulled a knife from the waistband of her skirt. If they try again, we'll be ready. Once that would have shocked me, but no longer. I picked up the sword and hung it over the fireplace. We would keep the children safe. Despite the late hour, sleep would not come. Eliza was deep in prayer by the bedside. I felt like an intruder. I fumbled in the clothes press for a candle and set it into the holder on the kitchen wall. The flickering light beat back the darkness. The kitchen looked as it had the night grandfather died. At least we hadn't suffered any more intruders. My head thumped. So much, so fast. I could not erase visions of the sick and dying. I paced the room. The children slept, Eliza still by their side with her head bent. I kicked something hard and hurt my toe. What could be on the floor? I got on my hands and knees and felt along the dark floor until I found a lump wrapped in a napkin. I carried it over to the candlelight. It was Nathaniel's painting. The flowers he sent to me when mother was ill. I pressed the picture to my cheek. Stay inside, Nathaniel, I thought. Stop tossing flowers out the window at passing girls and stay inside where you are safe. I smelled the cloth but found no trace of mother. Where was she? Was she alive? I had so much to tell her, so much to talk about. I would have traded anything to hear her swift footsteps across the floor. I laid my head on the kitchen table. As soon as I fell asleep, Eliza nudged my shoulder. Wake up, she said. I sprang to my feet and followed her into the front room. 
How are they? I asked. Eliza opened Robert's eyelids and then William's. Their eyes were bloodshot and yellow-stained. They are full of the pestilence, she said grimly. Nell seems to be faring better, but there is no question she has it too. She pressed her lips together to hold back the tears. It will be fine, Eliza. Think of all the people we've cared for. I survived this. Joseph survived. And so did thousands of others. We can do this. I know exactly what you're going to tell me to do. Stoke the fire and prepare to wash more dirty sheets. Caring for the children was harder than caring for other patients we had visited. Just as Robert fell asleep, William would wake crying. As soon as he was made comfortable enough to drift off, Robert would stiffen and jolt awake with a piercing scream. Nell didn't recognize me. She woke from terrible dreams and looked around the room blindly, crying for her mother. Night melted into day. Day surrendered to night. The small bodies gave off heat like an iron stove no matter what we used to bring down the fever. I hauled up bucket after bucket of cold well water until the rope blistered my hands and the blisters burst and bled. The floor beneath the mattress was a pool of water. We used up all the linens in the house, which I rinsed in vinegar and hung outside to dry. Eliza fashioned a fan that kept the bugs off the children and cooled them a bit, but it was so large and heavy that we could only wave it for a few minutes at a time. But as soon as we lay the fan down, they would whimper and cry. The food Mother Smith had hastily packed soon ran low, along with a cask of vinegar that Eliza had brought with us. I kept one eye on the window, watching for a society member carrying bread or dried meat for them. Eliza was more concerned about the dwindling supply of medicines, the mercury and calomel. She dosed the boys regularly and gently to purge the putrid bile from their bodies, but it seemed to have little effect. The twins cried in pain, in confusion, in terror. It was impossible to give Nell any medicine, we tried forcing it down her mouth, but it came right back up at us. It was all we could do to keep water in her stomach. On the fourth day, no, it must have been the fifth, an ominous silence pressed in on the room as the fever penetrated deeper. The boys turned frail, their skin ashen and their cheeks sinking as their bodies burned up under the infection. They didn't have the strength to suck their thumbs. Eliza moved William closer to Robert so they could draw some comfort from each other. Nell lay on her back, her breath coming in shallow pants. I set the fan on the floor. I had lost track of when I last ate or slept. Eliza picked it up and waved it over the tiny bodies until her arms shook with the effort. She set the fan on the foot of the mattress. I think we should find a doctor, Eliza said. They should be bled. No, Eliza, don't bleed them. It will kill them for sure. It won't work. I don't like the thought of cutting them either, but it may be our only hope. Dr. Rush recommends it. He was bled himself when he was ill. But the French doctors say bleeding kills people. Think of all the patients you've seen who died after the doctors bled them. They didn't bleed me, and I'm alive. Don't do it, Eliza. Eliza stared into the light of the sputtering candle. They took 20 ounces of blood from Joseph, and he will live for years. If Joseph is alive, it is in spite of the bleeding, not because of it. I grabbed Eliza's hands. Think of it. Dr. Rush has seen two or three epidemics in his life. The French doctors come from the West Indies, where they treat yellow fever every year. Surely their experience is more valuable. Eliza pulled a hand away and stroked William's arm. I don't know what else to do, she whispered. I promised their mother I wouldn't let them die. Trust me, please, I pleaded. They'll survive. I know they will. 
but if we bleed them, we'll deliver them to the grave. We can't cut them, Eliza. She looked up at me, struggling with her doubts. Trust me, I said firmly. Eliza nodded. All right, no bleeding. Robert woke with a shriek that ended all discussion. A few minutes later, William woke, vomiting blood and crying. Nell startled and cried weakly. We worked frantically drawing water, washing the burning bodies, and trying every herb, tea, and poultice to break the fever and banish the infection. The candle burned down to a puddle of wax, then a second and a third. In the stillest hour of the night, the children finally slept, their thin chests barely rising and falling. Eliza sat next to their bed, laid her head on the mattress, and fell asleep instantly. I picked up the bucket to fetch more water in preparation for the next crisis. I hooked the handle of the bucket onto the rope and let it down into the well. I tried to watch its progress, but it was soon swallowed up in the darkness. My eyes closed. It was never going to stop. We would suffer endlessly, with no time to rest, no time to sleep. The thick air clouded my head. The coffee house was silent. The bucket, I thought. I have to bring up the bucket. I reached for the crank handle. It slipped from my hand as I turned it, and I stumbled backward. I tried again, wrapping both hands around the handle and knitting my fingers together. The crank stiffened as if it were attached to a millstone instead of a wooden bucket. I searched for strength somewhere, some place inside me that had not been starved or fever burned or beaten or afraid. The crank turned once, twice. Each turn of the crank took a year of effort, summer, spring, fall and winter, and my tears splashed into the dust as the bucket climbed out of the earth. I pulled it to the side of the well. Shadows danced into the garden from the candlelight. I followed the jumping light into the garden, where dry stalks pointed to the skies like scrawny fingers, and rotted, wormy vegetables sank into the cracks of the parched soil. We were trapped in a night without end. I shook my head to clear it of the visions rolling across my mind. Where was the little girl who planted the bean seeds? Where were mother and grandfather and the dead mouse that flew out the window a hundred, a thousand years ago? And Blanchard's yellow silk balloon that tugged against its ropes, hungry to escape the confines of the prison yard. What became of it all? My eyes closed. I could see that clear January morning, the moment of release when the balloon floated above the rooftops. Thousands of voices cheered and screamed with delight. Nathaniel grasped my hand and we watched as the golden sphere ferried Monsieur Blanchard. As the golden sphere ferried Monsieur Blanchard and his little black dog away on the wind. I thought all things were possible in heaven and on earth that day. A whisper of wind passed by from the north. It lifted the hair off my face and rattled the squash vines. I shivered. Only the soles of my feet were warm, heated by dirt that had absorbed the sun all day. So tired. I lay down between the rows and rested my head on the ground. Chapter 26 October 23rd, 1793. I think there is now that kind of weather fermenting which we so much want and has been so often wished for. Letter of John Walsh, Clerk, Philadelphia, 1793. Something rough lapped at my cheek. I turned away with a groan. It followed and rubbed again, like a damp piece of burlap. I pushed it away and came up with a handful of orange fur. Silas, go away. Let me sleep. I haven't slept for years. Silas jumped on me, 
and kneaded with his front paws. The weight on my empty stomach hurt so much. I sat up, my head spinning. My eyes opened slowly, the lashes sticking together. I blinked. An early winter quill had etched an icy pattern over the garden. My skirt looked as if it had been dusted with fine white flour. I shivered. I was cold, truly cold, not cold with a fever or grip. I sneezed and bent to look closely at the white veil that lay over the weeds. Frost! I'm dreaming, I told Silas. The cat ignored me and pounced on a sluggish beetle that lumbered under a leaf. Starving men dream of food. I dream of frost. I rubbed my eyes and pushed myself to my feet. My back creaked as I rolled my shoulders. I breathed deeply. The cold air chilled my nose and crackled in my lungs. The fetid stench that had hung over the city for weeks was gone, replaced with brittle, pure air. I looked around the garden. No insects hovered over the dying plants or the well. The entire yard sparkled with diamonds of frost that quickly melted into millions of drops of water with a gentle kiss of the sun. Frost. This was no dream. Eliza! Eliza! Eliza stumbled out onto the porch, alarmed and confused. Look, Eliza! I cried. It's frost! The first frost! The end of the fever! She bent down to touch the pale crystals, then rubbed her cold fingertips over her lips. Lord have mercy, she whispered. We made it. She turned to me. We made it! We flung our arms around each other and jumped up and down laughing for joy. Wait, Eliza said suddenly as she pulled away. The children, we should bring them out here. Let them breathe in the clean air. Do you think that's wise? Won't they be chilled? All the work we've done to cool them down and you're worried they might catch a chill? It's just what they need. The bone-grinding fatigue and numbing hunger of the past weeks evaporated as we carried Grandfather's mattress down from the bedchamber and set it in the middle of the yard. Nell, Robert, and William fussed when they were brought outside, but they sat up enough to drink warm water sweetened with the last of the molasses, then fell asleep as their skin cooled gently. A messenger from Joseph arrived at midday bearing fresh eggs, pumpkins, three kinds of bread, and a joint of beef. Farmers had come back into town following the frost, and their prices dropped as quickly as the temperature. The messenger cautioned us to stay away from the center of town for another week. There were sure to be new fever cases until summer's grip was well and truly broken. Eliza told me to eat slowly or I would be sick again. For a change, I listened to her. We fed the children small bits of meat and warm cider. Eliza and I shared a loaf of bread at the kitchen table. Never had such a plain meal brought such satisfaction. When the children fell asleep after the meal, I took a nap even though it was the middle of the afternoon. I woke to the sound of heavy furniture being dragged across the floor. Eliza, what in the name of heaven? Eliza looked up. She had pushed the chest of drawers half the distance to the kitchen. I've been watching the signs, the way the birch leaves flip in the breeze, the shape of the clouds, and the color of the sun now that it's setting. I predict another frost tonight. We need to get all the furniture outside and expose it to the cold. It's the only way to destroy the pestilence. Come and help me with this chest. I thought it was a ridiculous notion, but I helped her carry the furniture we could handle outside. The children watched us as if it were completely normal to set furniture outside. Their fevers were broken and their stomachs full. They slept for hours woke for food, then went back to sleep. Joseph himself arrived the next morning with the news that the market had reopened. 
The twins and Nell were resting on the mattress under the cherry tree when he strode across the yard and took all three in his arms. Eliza and I let our tears fall without shame. Joseph opened the small sack he carried. He took out tops for the boys and a small doll for Nell, toys he had made for them by himself. As the children tried to spin the tops on the lumpy mattress, Joseph joined us on the porch. He took both Eliza's hands and mine and held them in his. Thank you, he said. Thank you for giving me back my boys. Balderdash, I said. Nothing could keep those rapscallions down for long. Pour yourself some cider and sit with us, said Eliza. We sat down comfortably and watched the children play. I poured a second mug of cider. You'll hear from your mother soon, I wager, Joseph said. Eliza shot her brother a warning look, but he ignored it. If I were you, I'd head down to the market, he continued. That's where all the best gossips in town have gathered. I glanced at Eliza. May I go? You don't need my permission, Eliza said. She was right. I could choose for myself. The market seemed like a festival, its stalls overflowing with food and rejoicing. It was noisier than ever before. Talk, talk, talk. Friends sharing the news. Overblown laughter. Strong-lunged farmers bellowing their wares. A welcome wave of noise and good cheer. I drifted from stall to stall, eavesdropping on good news and bad. Most of the conversations were about lost relatives and friends. Yellow fever had scattered the residents of Philadelphia to the four winds. No one could guess how long it would take until everyone was accounted for. Maddie Cook, Mrs. Epler cried. Thanks to good you survived, but you are so thin, Lickbin. You look just like your mother. She works so hard. Here, two fat hens for you and your family, and have some eggs. Thank you very much, Mrs. Epler, I said, pulling out my purse. No, no, no money. My gift, the plump egg seller insisted. How is Mrs. Cook? Did you go out to the country? I laid the dead hens in my basket. Mother is missing, I said. Grandfather is dead. Mrs. Epler's hands flew to her cheeks. You poor child. She pulled me close and squeezed me hard, her head barely as high as my shoulder. Little Maddie, little Maddie. It's fine, Mrs. Epler. I'll be fine. I unwrapped her arms from me. I'm sure Mother will be home soon, but please ask folks if they've seen her. Of course, of course, Mrs. Epler said, bobbing her head up and down. I'll ask everyone in the whole city. I had to smile at that. The news would be halfway to New York by nightfall if Mrs. Epler had anything to do with it. All the farmers were cheerful and generous. I paid very low prices for peaches, carrots, and beets. Though my basket was full, I found room for a sack of hard candy and a small loaf of sugar. For the children, I told myself. I had to taste the candy, of course, to make sure it was not stale. I was so vigilant that I tasted several pieces. Nell, Robert, and William deserved the best. My shopping was done, and I had questioned everyone about Mother, but still I lingered caught between wanting to leave and wanting to stay until I could sort out the thoughts battling in my head. What now? Should I travel to the Luddington's farm? Wait in town a few more days? I looked over a selection of bruised apples. Part of me did not want to know what had happened. If mother was dead, I'd have to sell the coffee house or have the orphan's court sell it for me. I'd get work as a scullery maid or move into the orphanage and do laundry. I looked past the apple cellar to the haberdasher's window behind me. My face looked back at me from the thick glass. Mrs. Zeppler was right. I was thin. Yellow fever had certainly done away with vanity. I lifted my chin. The shape of my face looked for all the world like mother's, her nose, her mouth. But my eyes were my own. I blinked. A scullery maid. Ridiculous. I was Maddie Cook, 
daughter of Lucille, granddaughter of Captain William Farnsworth Cook of the Pennsylvania 5th Regiment. I could read, write, and figure numbers faster than most. I was not afraid of hard work. I would set my own course. Someone placed a hand on my elbow. I hoped I might find you here. A low voice rumbled in my ear. My heart jumped. Nathaniel! I wanted to throw my arms around him or jump up and down or... I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to stop blushing. I tried to collect myself. How are you? I asked. Think of something intelligent, I commanded myself. Don't be a ninny. A slow smile spread across his face. Had he grown even taller? Much better now that I've found you, he said. His hand stayed on my elbow. I'm sorry I didn't bring you flowers. That's all right, I said, a ridiculous smile on my face. I have your painting on the mantle. It was beautiful. You look quite well. Did you have the fever? No, we were most fortunate. His hand was still on my elbow, warm and friendly. I liked having it there. Why don't I walk you home? He suggested. We walked slowly, step, step, stop and talk. Step, step, stop and talk. His voice had a low, sweet note in it, like a cello, and his smile lit up every shadow. I stopped worrying about being a ninny. I wanted to jump out the window when I saw you a few weeks ago, he said. I thought you were safely in the country. I was staying with Eliza and her family, I explained. The coffee house had been broken into by intruders. He lifted my chin. You look like you need a week's worth of cakes. Didn't Eliza feed you? There wasn't much food for anyone, I said. What about you? What did you eat? You know Mr. Peel. He always does things in a unique way. You've heard of the collection of animals he has? I nodded. Mr. Peel had opened a natural history museum in his house. We ate the specimens he had collected, before they were treated with arsenic and stuffed, of course. No, you didn't. Yes, we did. And I'll never eat possum again, I promise you, said Nathaniel. Disgusting. It was as much Master Peel's good humor that kept us going as much as anything. He stopped. We were in front of the coffee house. Some days felt like we were trapped in a nightmare, he said. It's hard to believe it's really over, I said. It feels so strange, so sudden. We're supposed to go back to the way we lived before, but everything has changed. The important things haven't changed at all, Nathaniel said. He stole an apple from my basket and took a bite. I will always snatch apples from your basket. You have my solemn word. A carriage turned off High Street and stopped halfway down the block. The door opened, and out popped the head of Mrs. Henning, my neighbor, wearing an absurd feathered hat. Her children poured out behind her and rushed the door of their house. It looked like they were returning from nothing more serious than an afternoon's drive in the country. "'Your mother will be home soon,' Nathaniel said confidently. "'She'll chase me off the front porch and try to marry you to a lawyer.' "'I won't let her.' I said, standing taller. Nell squealed in the house, and the twins laughed. Nathaniel and I had suddenly run out of things to say. Well, I should go home, he mumbled. I may stop in from time to time, make sure you're well. That would be nice, I said. Don't worry, she'll be home soon. I tried to smile. No matter how kind he was, it couldn't erase the question that had haunted me all afternoon. What if she didn't come home at all? Chapter 27 October 30th, 1793 Blessed be God for the change in the weather. The disease visibly and universally declines. Dr. Benjamin Rush, Letter, 1793 Nathaniel was a constant caller that week. Mr. Peel had given him a free rein to wander and enjoy himself after being cooped up in the house. 
Nathaniel said all of the peels were outside as much as possible. He predicted that the painting family would soon produce a number of landscapes. As word of the frost spread, hundreds of people swarmed into town. The returnees were all well fed. They called to each other in annoying, bright voices. I wanted to tell them to hush. It felt like they were dancing on a grave with no thought to the suffering that had escaped. Those of us who had remained behind were gaunt and pale. People who were dosed with mercury spat frequently and covered their mouths to hide their blackened teeth. Eliza reminded me not to be bitter, but it was hard. With every hour that passed, Philadelphia shed the appearance of a ghost city and looked more and more like the capital of the United States. Like a wilted flower stuck in a bowl of water, it drew strength and blossomed. Nathaniel talked about painting the rebirth of the city. I thought he would do a grand job. Nathaniel and I walked outside together as often as possible. My favorite time was just before sundown, when the dinner dishes were washed and the children were ready for bed. Nathaniel would pass by the front door at just the right time. I would pretend to be surprised to see him, and he would feign shock that a busy girl like me had time for a stroll. The first few walks only took us a few blocks and back. Then we went as far as the giant burial ground where Grandfather rested. The dirt had been smoothed over, and grass had already started growing in patches. I tried to remember exactly where he lay, but it looked different without the confusion of grave diggers and heaps of earth. Don't fret, Nathaniel said. We know he's here. He wouldn't want you to fuss about a headstone anyway. I nodded. Maybe it's better that he's buried here. He would want to be in as large a crowd as possible. I bet there are more of his friends here than in the cemetery. And he'll hear better stories, he said. We turned to walk home. Any news? I shook my head. I've written several letters, but they're useless until the post office opens. The newspaper won't run any advertisements before the end of the year. Don't give up hope. It was Eliza's idea to have a small feast of Thanksgiving with Joseph and the boys. I suggested Mother Smith, too. We didn't need to discuss Nathaniel. Of course he would come. Keeping the children out of the kitchen while we were cooking reminded me of trying to catch fish in my petticoat. No matter how I tried to get hold of the giggling twins, they always slipped away. Nell was the sneaky one. She waited until my hands were full with the boys, then stole a bite from the table. I finally filled the butter churn and set it on the back porch. I told them they would get a wonderful treat just as soon as they turned that milk into butter. That kept them busy for a while. At long last, we sat down to a table filled with food. Mother Smith blessed the meal. Dear Lord, We give thanks for your blessings, for bringing us through these days of pestilence. We thank you. For saving our children. We thank you. For restoring us. For watching over us. For giving us this bounty. We thank you. Watch over those who have passed, Lord. Watch my Betty, Joseph said, his voice cracking. The twins looked on as their father fought to control his grief. Though we were all healed of the fever, some wounds were inside the heart and would mend slowly. Keep them close until we're ready to join them. Mother Smith concluded, Blessed be thy name. Amen. We were solemn and quiet for a moment, but three hungry children soon distracted us. It was time to feast. I had forgotten what it felt like to sit down to a proper meal said Joseph as he cut the beef on William's plate. This is a mighty spread. You set a good table for a girl, said Mother Smith. Hardly a girl any more, remarked Eliza. I couldn't have done it without your help, I said. I've been very lucky. You made your luck, corrected Mother Smith. "Mm Mm-hmm, mumbled Nathaniel. I thought he was agreeing, but his mouth was so full it was hard to tell. He reached for more potatoes and winked at me. "'Any news from your mother?' asked Joseph. "'Seems to me that—' 
Eliza shoved the bowl of beans at Joseph to cut him off. I knew what he was about to say. He thought Mother had died. So did Eliza. She'll be back soon, said Mother Smith as she spooned more carrots onto her plate. I can feel it in my bones, and they never lie. Stop fretting and pass me the butter. A contented silence settled over the table as everyone ate their fill. It wasn't until I set out the pies for dessert that Joseph spoke again. Have you decided your price, Matilda? What price? The price for the coffee house. You've got a good spot here. You sell this place, you'll get enough money to set you up nice. Joseph! Eliza scolded her brother. What? he protested. She has to be practical. What's she going to do? She could work with Mrs. Peel, suggested Nathaniel. The Lord will work it out, Mother Smith said. The Lord helps those who help themselves, Joseph said. It's no use pretending. This business needs to be sold for Maddie's dowry, and Eliza has here to find a new job. Eliza could work for Mrs. Peel, too, said Nathaniel. They are in desperate need of a good cook. The other one quit after the possum. Mind your own business, boy, Eliza snapped. He's just trying to help. Joseph said, we're all trying to help. Everyone thought they knew what was right for me. It was just like listening to mother and grandfather making the decisions while I stood to the side. I put down my knife. This would not do. It was time to bring out the plan that had hatched days earlier when I saw my face in the window. I'm not selling, I said loudly. The argument stopped and everyone looked at me. I'm going to open the coffee house for business tomorrow. More the fool you then, replied Joseph. You'll never run it on your own. I don't have to, I answered. I'm taking on a partner. A partner who? asked Eliza. She glared at Nathaniel, who shook his head. Not me, he said quickly. What do you know about taking on a partner? Eliza asked. Plenty, I said. My partner has to be someone I can trust, someone who knows how to run a coffee house and isn't afraid to give me a kick in the backside every now and then to keep me on the right path. Eliza set her fork down. Speak plainly, child. I'm not fine of riddles. I swallowed. Eliza, I want you to be my partner. There's no one better suited to it, no one I can trust or who will put up with me. Even Nell sat quietly. Maddie, I don't have the money to buy a partnership from you. It's kind of you to ask, but I can't. No, oh no, you don't understand. I couldn't take your money. I'm sharing it with you. It's the right thing to do, and it's good business. Eliza started to speak, but the words wouldn't come. This was not what I had expected. She was supposed to say yes. And then we would dance a jig. It won't work, Eliza said. We'll make it work, I countered. It wouldn't be right, Eliza answered. Don't, don't you want to work here? I asked. I know Joseph needs you to help with the boys. They could stay here with us. And Nell, this way Nell can stay with us too. It's the perfect solution. Crack! Mother Smith banged her cane so hard on the floor that it dented the board. She'll take it, said Mother Smith firmly, and no nonsense from you. She added as she wagged her finger at Eliza, it's an opportunity, one you deserve, one offered from the heart. I know you, Eliza. You'll worry about shillings and pence, so save from your share of the earnings and pay out of that. She'll take it. You'll need a lawyer to write it out, said Joseph gravely. No, we won't, I said. I couldn't cheat, Eliza. I can barely sneak a piece of cheese from the larder without feeling bad. Joseph smiled. I wasn't thinking of you. I was thinking about others. Some folk will say Eliza took advantage of you. They don't like to see black people move up. Joseph's right, said Mother Smith. People love to talk, so you'll do it by the law with lawyers and wax seals and all. Say yes, Eliza, so I can eat my pie. Eliza looked around the table. It doesn't seem I have a choice, Eliza said. I leaned over and wrapped my arms around her. 
Nathaniel lifted his cider mug to toast the two of us. A rapid knock at the front door broke up the celebration. I'll get it, I said. Eat up, everyone. There's more in the kitchen. A messenger stood at the door, hat in hand. Excuse me, ma'am, he said. I'm to ask for the proprietor of cooks. I cleared my throat and smoothed my skirt. I am one of the owners. What can I do for you? The boy held out a bulging sack. My master, Jasper Blake, asked that I bring you these coffee beans and mention that his warehouse is open for business. He handed me the sack. We expect to ship soon out of Liverpool carrying the finest teas and beans. Your business will be appreciated. I know the name of your master well, I replied. You may convey my thanks to him. I am pleased that he has come through the plague days. Tell him I look forward to examining his goods. The boy grinned as I slipped him a coin. As I returned to the table, Nathaniel stood up and imitated me, pretending to smooth a skirt and fix his hair. You may convey my thanks, he teased. Stop, I laughed. If I'm going to help run this place, I had better act the part. I covered my mouth and giggled. It did feel a bit like play acting. Better get used to that, said Joseph. When word gets out that the Cook Coffee House is open for business again, you won't be able to keep tradesmen or customers away. Chapter 28, November 10th, 1793. Many stores are lately opened, and the city exhibits a scene of increasing trade and bustle. Letter of John Walsh, Clerk, Philadelphia, 1793. Three days after we opened for business, every chair in the front room was filled, the air thick again with arguments, tobacco smoke, and the smell of fresh coffee and cakes. Eliza was in the kitchen cooking up a storm, and the room had never been cleaner. Mother would have been very proud. I carried a tray above my head. Who wants to try some apple cake? A free sample, I offered. Over here, Maddie, over here. The shouts came from all directions. I smiled. Free samples were proving a clever way to get the customers to eat more. Feed them one bite and they'd pay for three more. I quickly distributed the small pieces of apple cake and went through refilling coffee mugs. Another cup? I asked. I picked up a mug in front of a doctor studying the chessboard. He nodded deep in concentration. He kept his finger on his queen, in danger of being captured by his opponent's pawn. Could I get some soup, too? he asked. This match is far from over. Me, too, said his companion. How about some mutton stew? I asked. Perfect. Ha! The doctor rescued the queen by moving his knight. Scoundrel, muttered the other man. Right away, sir. I said, picking up the tray. Eliza and Nathaniel sat in the kitchen. He had stepped in to help us with Aaron since we opened. He was also Eliza's taste tester. We need more stew, I said. Two bowls. She shook her head. This keeps up. We'll be serving breakfast, too. I have plenty of ideas, I assured her. What if we baked small cakes and delivered them to the state house with a handbill advertising our new wares? Eliza frowned. How many cakes? The price of sugar is still high. How about apple bread instead? That's cheaper to make. Nathaniel cleared his throat. I could paint a sign that you could put out front. I could make a design for the handbill, too. And I suppose we'll pay you in cakes, right? I joked. That would suit me fine. He rose from his chair. I have to go to Peel. See you tomorrow. Eliza waited until he had gone. He's useful for a painter. I smiled. Where are the children? Sleeping, thank goodness. When they wake up, I'm going to set them to work churning butter again. That kept you and Polly out of trouble when you were small. I nodded. I want to visit Polly's mother on Sunday. Don't let me forget. Now, I need two bowls of mutton stew. When I had served the stew and filled up the next round of empty cups, I surveyed the room. It was brighter with Nathaniel's paintings on the walls. He had already sold two. 
Watson next door was interested in selling his lot, but I couldn't afford to build an addition to the coffee house. Not yet. Maybe by spring. The weather would be better then anyway. Everything was going the way I had planned, but I felt hollow. The outside of my life was sound. Eliza and I had the coffee house. Nathaniel and I had an understanding, Nell would say. I was still a long way from being able to travel to Paris. But it would happen some day. And yet, the fever lingered. Grandfather's chair by the hearth stood empty. The parrot's cage was gone. The ghosts of friends lost in the last months flitted across when I least expected them. And then there was the ache I avoided most of all. The front door swung open with a crash. All conversation ceased. It was Nathaniel struggling to catch his breath. It's the president, he said. President Washington, he's returned. He's coming down High Street right now. The men all abandoned their chairs at once and fought to get out the door. I looked back in the kitchen. I got a cake rising, Eliza said. I'm not leaving that for any man. You go on. Come on, Maddie, Nathaniel called. Hurry. High Street was already lined with people, all peering anxiously up the road. Nathaniel grabbed my hand and pulled me along until we found a break in the crowd. There he is, someone shouted. Huzzah! Huzzah! General George is back! The crowd roared in approval. Men took off their hats and waved them. Women fluttered handkerchiefs, and children jumped up and down. A group of three riders proceeded down the middle of the street. Advisors, Nathaniel said. They don't count. Look, there he is. The president rode a few paces behind, calmly smiling and waving at the crowd. He rode his beautiful white horse, reins in one hand and his hat in the other. He nodded to the crowd with a dignified air. If Grandfather were here, he'd be busting his buttons by now. I never thought Washington was handsome, but on that horse, he looked like something special. He was our leader. The crowd continued cheering and waving until he was far down the block. If the president was back then the fever was truly over. If the president was back, we were safe. I threw my arms around Nathaniel and planted a big kiss on his cheek. He pulled back in surprise. Do you always do that when the president rides by? If so, I'll take a job working for him. I blushed and looked down at my feet. I'm just so happy, I said. The crowd was thinning. Some people followed down High Street. Others went back to what they had been doing. My afternoon customers hurried back to the coffee house. That was a comforting sight. Nathaniel pointed back up the road. Who do you think all of those people are? Following behind the president's entourage came a scraggly parade of wagons and carriages. Members of the cabinet? I ventured. A man standing next to us shook his head. No, Them's the folks that waited. They waited until General George came back. Knew it would be safe then. The fever gone. One of the carriages turned off High Street and stopped in front of the coffee house. Time to get back to work, Miss Cook, Nathaniel said. Look, we've got another customer. The driver and a woman dressed in country clothes were gently helping a frail woman with gray in her hair step out of the carriage. She leaned heavily on their arms. When her feet were on the ground, she raised her face to us. Tired, familiar, beautiful. Mother had come home. Chapter 29, November 10th, 1793. The yellow fever will discourage the growth of great cities in our nation. Thomas Jefferson, letter to Dr. Benjamin Rush. 1800. I dashed across the street without looking. Mother! I gathered her into my arms. She felt like a frail bird. We stood in silence, rocking and holding on to each other as if the rest of the world didn't matter, which was true. At last she pulled away from me with a sigh. I need to sit down. 
she said with a weak smile. Where are my manners? Matilda, this is my good friend, Mrs. Luddington. I curtsied out of habit. You've been with the Luddingtons this whole time? Nathaniel stepped forward. Good day, Mrs. Cook. It is a pleasure to see you survive the terrible pestilence. Why don't go we inside where you'll be more comfortable? What a good idea, Mother said. Nathaniel Benson, that's your name? Yes, ma'am, he said, very respectful, very smart. I waited for her to make a sharp-tongued remark, but she didn't. Mother could not walk unaided. Mrs. Luddington took one arm, and I took the other to help her. Nathaniel walked ahead and opened the door for us. As we crossed the threshold, the company in the front room fell silent. They were all as shocked by Mother's appearance as I was. The doctor at the chessboard stood in respect. His companion did the same. Then every man in the room rose to his feet to honor her. She paused for a moment. Thank you, gentlemen. Lucille! Eliza stood in the kitchen doorway, her hand covering her mouth. She took two steps and hugged Mother, tears flowing freely and without apology. Oh, my Lord, she said, wiping away the tears. Let's get into the kitchen. I helped Mother sit at the kitchen table. Mrs. Luddington sat across from her. Eliza quickly poured coffee for all of us, then grabbed a serving tray. "'You stay here and catch up,' she commanded me. "'I'll take care of the front room. If I get desperate, I'll use that painter of yours.' Mother picked up her mug, her hand shaking. She sipped once, then set the mug down. It seemed too heavy for her to hold. There were so many questions, so much to say. Where should I start?' Do you feel well? I asked. She nodded once. I require a nap these days, she said with a hint of her old self. Imagine that, if you will. Your mother is still recovering, Mrs. Luddington explained. The doctor says it's a miracle she survived at all. Bunkum, Mother said. Mrs. Luddington smiled. It's not bunkum, Lucille. She turned to me. Your mother joined us at the farm a few days after she sent you and your grandfather on. When she realized you were lost, she went wild. I was concerned, Mother said. We tried to keep her in bed. It was clear she was still quite ill. We sent messages to every town we could think of, but those who bothered to reply had not seen you. Lucille was frantic. She rose at midnight and took one of our horses to search for you herself. We found her two days later, near death at the side of the road. It took weeks for her to recover. I'm much better now, Mother said. Mrs. Luddington shook her head in disagreement. We came when we heard that President Washington was returning. Lucille said that would be the sign that your grandfather was waiting for. Where is the captain? I didn't see him when we came in. He died, I said flatly. Oh, oh my, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Luddington said. Mother looked into the fire. I waited for her questions, but there were none. Did the doctor prescribe any treatments for you, Mother? I asked. Mrs. Luddington jumped in. She's supposed to live a life of leisure. Those were his exact words. The second attack nearly took her off to join your father. It damaged her heart. She arched her eyebrows. She won't be able to run the coffee house anymore. She should sell it and buy a small house near us. Mother pressed her lips together tightly. We'll talk about that later, I said quickly. Can I get you something to eat, Mrs. Luddington? Some stew? The farmer's wife stood up. I promised my husband I would return today, and it is a long ride back. I must go. I tried to convince her to stay the night, or at least take a meal with us, but she was determined. She bent over and hugged Mother briefly, said goodbye to me, and left. I peeked in the front room. A few customers had left. The rest were smoking their pipes and enjoying their conversation. Mother coughed. Is this your work or Eliza's? she asked. Mine, 
I said as I sat down across from her. I wanted to open again. Eliza wanted me to sell. The clock ticked. William is dead, then? The clock ticked again, then rang the hour. I waited until the noise stopped. Yes, in September. Oh, Maddie. Tears welled in Mother's eyes. Dear God, I was so worried. I couldn't find you, no matter where I looked. I searched and searched until I fell ill again. I couldn't sleep. I was so afraid you were... I'm fine. I'm fine. Shh, please don't cry. Everything is better now. I'm home. You're home. You don't have to worry anymore. I drew up a chair next to her, and she leaned against my shoulders. I cradled her head in my arms until her sobs quieted. Tell me how you fared, she said. I can remember so little, and I've lost track of all the weeks. I told her everything, from the time the death cart dumped her at the front door to the first frost. I didn't give her all the details of the intruders, or the night Grandfather died. There would be time for that later, when she felt stronger. Mother's eyes drifted back to the fire burning in the hearth. Her hands lay in her lap, withered and limp. I had never seen her hands stay still before. They had always been busy with cleaning or needlework or polishing. I had a sudden sense of what was to come, and I blinked away the tears. Help me upstairs, Maddie, Mother said. I need to rest. Epilogue December 11th, 1793 We are devoutly to acknowledge that kind providence hath restored our city to its useful state of health and prosperity. Petitions of Citizens to the Council of Philadelphia, 1793 I opened one eye. A scratching noise in the corner of the room had woken me. The scrambling feet of a desperate mouse about to become breakfast for a lumpy orange cat. I winced as Silas pounced. The squeaking stopped. I rolled over to look out the window. It was dark still. The faint call of a watchman can be heard down 7th Street, and a few stars hung still in the sky. I burrowed beneath the warm weight of my quilt. My toes curled at the thought of crossing the icy floorboards on a dark December morning. Nothing gained by delay, I thought. No one else is going to get the house stirring. I snatched my stockings off the stool next to my bed and pulled them on under the covers, taking care not to disturb Nell, who slept beside me. Thank goodness she had learned not to wet the bed before the weather turned cold. I tucked the quilt around her and stood up. Quickly changing into my clean day shift, I stepped into my woolen overskirts, laced my stays, and wrapped a heavy shawl over my bodice. Mother rolled over and snored quietly. She had coughed late into the night. It was good for her to sleep peacefully. I nudged Silas with my toe. The cat daintily picked up his breakfast and made for the stairs. I crossed the hall to the other bedchamber. Eliza stirred in her sleep, mumbling about ginger and nutmeg. Robert and William slept soundly, their arms wrapped around each other in their trundle bed their chests rising and falling in unison. I crept down the stairs, careful to skip the squeaky ones. I dug out the embers from the ashes of the kitchen fireplace and laid tinder on them. The dry wood caught quickly and the flames soon warmed my face and hands. I swung the kettle over the flames and looked into the fire while the water heated. Eliza would want to send the twins to fetch the day's newspapers. Mother would fuss, of course. She didn't think they were old enough to do anything besides raise a ruckus in the garden. The sooner we could afford a pony and cart, the better. That way Mother could run errands together with the boys, and Eliza and I could get some work done in peace. It would be nice to finish putting by the mincemeat before the snow came for good. Nell still refused to leave my side, but I didn't mind. The water finally boiled. I made a coffee for myself, a mug for Eliza, and one for Mother. 
I cut a lump of sugar off the loaf and added it, along with a healthy dollop of milk, to my mug. Being the first one awake did bring some privileges, I thought with a smile. Overhead footsteps crossed the room. I hurried to set out the breakfast dishes before Eliza came downstairs. She didn't begrudge me a few minutes of quiet, but the table setting came first. When the crockery was laid out, I carried my mug through the front room, past the polished tables and backgammon boards, past the beautiful new painting of a meadow full of flowers. I backed up to adjust the painting so it hung nice and straight. Nathaniel was coming along nicely, Mr. Peel said. Three years, maybe four, and he would be able to support himself. That wasn't long to wait. I opened the front door and sat on the step facing High Street. A lamplighter, some blocks down, reached up with his long pole to extinguish the street lamp. To the east, beyond the river, the stars faded before the promise of a new day. These solitary minutes each morning were fast becoming a habit, a good habit, but one I would soon need a woolen cloak to enjoy. The sky brightened to a dull bronze glow as the last of the season's geese rushed southward, flying so low I could hear the beat of their wings against the morning air. I drained the mug reluctantly and scraped my finger along the bottom to get the last of the undissolved sugar. Looking down the peaceful street, it seemed no one could imagine the terror we had all endured. There were many tables with empty places, or invalids who had once been as strong as horses. But the sun continued to rise. People filled the street each day. On Sunday, the church bells rang. Philadelphia had moved on. Early morning was the only time I felt as if there were ghosts nearby. Memories of the weeks of fear. That's when I found myself listening for Polly's giggle or Grandfather's voice. Sometimes they felt so close, close enough to tell me I should stop dawdling and get to work. I smiled as the mist faded. The yellow sun rose, a giant balloon filled with prayers and hopes and promise. I stood and shook the idleness out of my skirts. Day was begun.